Монгорын мгийн жаргалтсан мас орж ирээ 5 жил болж байна.
to this first EBRD Green Cities event in person since 2019. My name is Nigel Jollins, and together with my colleague Lynn O'Grady, we co-lead EBRD Green Cities, and we'll be your Masters of Ceremony today. Now, with over half of the world's population living in cities, cities have to be resilient to shocks, whether that's a pandemic, whether that's natural disasters, or the current energy crisis. And with COP27 approaching in Egypt, cities need to start asking themselves about how they can be in the lead for this low carbon transition. Also, a question about how institutions like the EBRD can play a role in assisting cities in this low carbon transition. So these are some of the questions that we're going to address together today. We will explore how to, ma how to make greenery a reality. So this will be addressed first in an opening, opening panel on energy resilience through the lens of our green city mayors and governors, the private sector and sector experts. After this plenary panel, we will move to a fireside chat on gender to discuss Vienna, its pioneering experience in mainstreaming gender in the city and draw on lessons learned and good practice from, from cities in our EBRD region. Then we'll have breakout discussions later today, which will offer you the opportunity to interact, and that's very important in, the, in today's events, on the role played by capital markets, digital, e-mobility, nature-based solutions. This is the future of EBRD Green Cities. There will also be a meeting of our Green City Officer Network and launching of the Green Cities Innovation Challenge. Thank you, Lynn. Okay, some uh, logistics now. So for those of you who require interpretation, uh, you should have a headset. If you don't already, um, please make yourself known and we can get headsets to you. Yes, I think Bianca up the back here will bring you a headset. She's waving her hand. Um, okay, so channel one is Arabic. I'm trying to get this from memory. Channel two, Russian. Channel three, Turkish. And channel four, English. Did I get that right? Thank you. Good. We're also going to be using uh, some whiz technology called Slido to manage questions. So there should be a QR code appearing behind me. Here we go. Uh, if you are um, familiar with how to use QR codes, this will take you to Slido. And if you enter the code GREEN2022, you will enter this conference. We'll be keeping an eye on this Slido for questions during the panel uh, and throughout the day. When you're posting a question, please identify who you're, you're, yourself, the city or institution you're from, and please keep your questions uh, short. Thank you. Um, without further ado then, I'll hand over to Lynn, who's going to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker to give the welcome address is Mr. Omar al Rawi, who is the member of the Vienna State Parliament and Municipal Council. So if you would please come to the stage. Thank you. Dear mayors, high-ranking city representatives, dear representatives of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, ladies and gentlemen, and wunderschönen good morning, bonjour, buenos dias, to our guest, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, to our Turkish guest, Gunaydin. I hope I didn't forget a language for our guest from Erivan. I was pro uh, you might maybe wonder where my typical Viennese name comes. So I was born in Baghdad 61 years ago. I know I look much younger, thank you very much. And, uh, and I was rose in Basra, so there was a big Armenian community there. So the only thing I remember is inch pieces, inch kisses, love them, shut love them. So this is the, the thing I can <clears throat> tell you. 
I would like to warmly welcome you to the Green Cities Annual uh, Conference 2022 here in the very famous uh, Wappensaal. It's translated in English. I was wondering that this is the name, Blasonary Hall of Vienna City Hall. And I would like to thank the European Bank for reconstruction and development for organizing today's event. The city of Vienna and the ARBD enjoy a long and mutual beneficial cooperation. We are proud to host this year's conference and I'm very happy that representatives of cities from many countries are here today and have traveled to Vienna especially for this conference. I also welcome all those who are following the event uh, online. Uh, it's interesting because just last week there was an event in, in, in Daejeon in South Korea and there were uh, the representatives of the UCLG of the United Cities uh, and local governments. So we see that uh, there was a big Moroccan delegation there, and there was also a big Turkish delegation there, and there was representatives of Egypt and all over the world. And now we are meeting in Vienna, so the world is uh, coming uh, together. And uh, unfortunately, uh, our mayor, uh, Dr. Michael Ludwig, was unable to attend today due to scheduling reasons. Uh, and on his behalf, I would like to extend uh, his best wishes to you all. Well, two years ago, the COVID pandemic seemed to be the biggest crisis. We are now confronted with a new acute crisis in the center of Europe due to the war in, the, in Ukraine, which makes us aware of our own vulnerability. In addition, the central challenge of our time the global climate crisis must be overcome. As cities, we all face similar challenges, especially in these crisis situations. The cities are the ones developing unbureaucratic solutions oriented towards needs and citizens, often faster than the national level it is therefore important that we join forces. F formats like these conferences organizes in the RBD make it possible and promote mutual exchange. I would like also to emphasize that about 50% of all the, the world population are living in cities and within the next 20 years, maybe 70 to 80% of all the people will, will be living in cities. And I am convinced that mayors, and so for those who maybe read the book of Benjamin Baba, who once mentioned if mayors could rule the world, and he came at the end to the conclusion it would be a better world. <laughs> With our comprehensive sustainable smart uh, climate city strategy and derived from the climate guide, Vienna itself, itself ambitious goals for sustainable climate neutral urban development. Our central goal is to become climate neutral by 2040. For our efforts in this regard, Vienna was awarded the prestigious Lee Kuan Yew World Prize, City Prize in Singapore uh, in this summer. Especially in the areas of sustainability, Vienna has made major investments in recent years. The energy crisis, dramatically intensified by the war in the Ukraine, makes the need for a switch to sustainable, renewable energy sources visible. For example, in Vienna, 230,000 households are to be supplied with electricity from solar power by 2030. And thanks to our major photovoltaic push, the annual increase and the photovoltaic models will be equivalent to the size of approximately 100 football fields. It is not only the power of the sun that is to be used in the energy transition. Together with research partners, we are drilling to a depth of 3,000 meters to provide geothermal energy for up to 125,000 Viennese households. Hand in hand with the development of new energy sources in a large-scale initiative for the thermal renovation of existing building and the simultaneous conversion of heating systems. Adhering to the motto, out of oil and gas, we want to leave behind our dependence on mostly imported fossil fuels as quickly as possible. 
We support the, necess the necessary private investments with the help of broad program of advisory services and uh, subsidies. Vienna is not only investing in sustainable energy and heat supply, but is also expanding in public transportation. I hope that you will uh, experience it during the stay in Vienna. Public transport providers already transport around 2 million passengers per day. We are very proud that we have an annual ticket for only 365 euros. That's mean one euro a day, and you can use the whole entire public transportation in Vienna. And with the large-scale U2, U5 project, maybe you saw the, 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 uh, the building project near the, the Rathaus, this is the new uh, underground line that uh, is now uh, uh, under construction, and that would add the possibility for one-third more Viennese to use uh, public transportation. Tomorrow you will be in, get insight into a sustainable city future uh, uh, during your field trip to the urban development area of the Seestadt Aspen. It is one of the largest urban development areas in Europe. In several stages, high quality housing space for more than 25,000 people is being built next to a special created lake in the heart of the district. That's why Seestadt, it's, it's a lake in, inside. Uh, and Seestadt Aspen functions not only as a place to live and work, but also as an urban laboratory. Many sustainable urban and experience is being gathered for the sustainable urban development of the future. Seestadt Aspen is also home to several projects that show that the close collaboration between the city, science and research, as well as innovative companies can lead to joint success. Uh, as uh, Aspen Smart City Research and the Hydrogen Research Center, for example, research and development is being carried out on energy topics and an education campus is being built together with private property developers and two locations. A sustainable, resilient city of the future needs not only stringent strategies and measures, but also strong alliances and implementation. There we tried and uh, implemented the first uh, uh, automatically driving buses, for example, in this, uh, in this quarter. With this in mind, we look forward to sharing our experience and approaches with you during these two conferences. I wish you, will, you all the best for the talks and discussions that will be held for tomorrow's and field trip, and I hope that you will have enough time also for social events. Thank you very much for joining this conference, for accepting our invitation, and thank you, ERBD, for organizing this event. Looking forward to see you again, again as guests, as friends, as tourists, uh, as uh, members of delegation. All the best for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Alrawi. Thank you very much for your warm welcome to the city of Vienna. And you're right, you look much younger than your age. I wouldn't have put more than 60, I guess. Um, thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce Harry Boyd Carpenter, uh, Managing Director of Climate Strategy and Delivery at the bank, who will give us a keynote address. Harry, the floor is yours. Uh, so Mr. Arouawi gave us a fantastic demonstration of linguistic fluency in, I think, seven, eight languages. I'm English, and English people are famous for their linguistic skills, so I would just say good morning and thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you all, both here in Vienna and in our live stream audience, for joining us. Um, and let me thank Mr. Awari um, and indeed the city of Vienna for making this incredible venue uh, available to us. Vienna is consistently chosen as one of the most livable cities in the world, and it's a great opportunity for us all to be here and, and to learn why that's the case, what lessons we can take back uh, and deploy in our own cities and our own projects. Um, we're delighted to see so many green cities here. Uh, I think we have 36 today, from Agadir in the west to Seme in the east, Alexandria in the south. But let me especially acknowledge the representatives from seven cities in Ukraine that are not able to join us today. From Dnipro, from Kyiv, from Kharkiv, from Khmelnytsky, from Kriviri, from Lviv, and from Mariupol. 
We are very sorry, we're deeply sorry that you cannot be with us today. We send you our solidarity and we look forward to better times when you can join us in person. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is a clear and present threat. It requires a tectonic shift to economies. We have to change everything about the way we run our cities and we run our economies if we want to preserve and grow the standard of living that we currently enjoy. And cities are central to that. As Mr. Arawi already mentioned, they count for 55% of global population now and close to 80% by 2050. That's why we established the GBRD Green Cities Programme. And that's why we are happy that we now count more than 55 cities in 24 countries. But we're not just about counting the cities and counting the green action plans. It's also about investment and projects. And we've invested nearly 2 billion euros in 75 green cities projects, mitigating nearly 1.5 million tonnes of carbon a year, which is equivalent to taking more than 300,000 cars off the road. But it isn't just about carbon, of course because taking cars off a road is also about local pollution. Doing energy efficiency projects in buildings is about improving the quality of living for people right here, right now. So for us, green cities is just that. It's green, sustainable cities, the quality of life for the citizens of those cities. It's not just about climate and carbon, however important that may be. And let me give you some practical examples of the projects we've done. In the Western Balkans, we've worked with the Sarajevo administration to improve the energy efficiency in 40 public buildings, making schools and hospitals warmer while reducing their energy bills. In Georgia, in Batumi, our first electric bus investment is providing clean and reliable transport to the citizens of Batumi and its many visitors. In Egypt, the 6th of October dry port public-private partnership is transforming supply logistics, harnessing private money to create jobs and generate economic growth. And in Central Asia, in Kazakhstan, a new wastewater treatment plant in Shimkent will serve 240,000 residents. So I said that the EBRD Green Cities Program is about investments, but again, it goes beyond that because the Green City Action Plan process is also an opportunity to engage civil society, local academia, think tanks, the private sector, your citizens. And I'm very proud that one of the other numbers we, are, we have, have to report is that more than 86,000 citizens have been involved in the development of green city action plans, helping to set the environmental priorities for their cities. We want to support you in building cities that are deeply resilient and sustainable. And first and foremost, that means having plans and investments that all stakeholders have had a voice in. And if I may pick up on one other comment that Ms. Arawari made about the city of Vienna's net zero commitment by 2040. Some green cities already have a net zero commitment. For those that don't, we'd like to encourage you to go for that. It's a really powerful statement. It's a statement to your citizens, and it's a statement to potential investors in your city. And one thing I can promise you, if you're interested in a net zero commitment, you need a plan, EBRD will be there for you. We will help you make that plan. We will help you write that plan. So if you're interested in that, the stall will be open later today. Our team is available on your, on your request. We couldn't do all this work on green cities without the generous support of our donors. I hope you'll forgive me for listing all of them. It's a long list. I'll go through it quickly. But it's important because these donors are absolutely essential. None of these projects would happen without them. The Green Climate Fund is the main sponsor of a conference. The City of Vienna is our generous host. And in addition to those, we have uh, the multilateral donors, the Central European Initiative Fund, the Clean Technology Fund, the Global Environment Facility, the Green Energy Special Fund, EBRD's own shareholder special fund, the European Union, and in particular the West Balkans Investment Fund, the generous donors to EBRD's high impact partnership on climate action, and the Sustainable Infrastructure Fund. And then we also have a number of bilateral donors, starting of course with the government of Austria, but then going on to the, um, the, the Taiwan Business uh, Technical Cooperation Fund, who are generously sponsoring the Innovation Challenge session today, the Czech Republic Technical Cooperation Fund, the Government of Finland, the Japan EBRD Cooperation Fund, uh, the Government of Korea, the Government of Poland, and the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. And finally, I should, I should mention the city networks that we work with very closely, from ICLEI and C40 to the City's Climate Finance Leadership Alliance and the Global Covenant of Mayors. So with this, I wish all of us a very good conference with plenty to learn, 
new ideas to hear and to share, old friendships to be renewed, and new friendships formed. And hand back to Lynn and Nigel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you for that keynote address. And um, what I would like to do now is just acknowledge that we also have a large online audience watching from YouTube and through EBRD.com. And I would also like to point out that we have a photographer here today, Rudy. Where is Rudy? Rudy's wandering around with the camera. You'll recognize him. He, if he approaches you, there he is at the back there. If he approaches you, it's not some dodgy guy. It is Rudy, the formal photographer. And he will be um, taking photos to, of the event. Right, well, now what I'd like to do is introduce the next and plenary panel. I see Mayor Arion is here, welcome. Uh, this panel is on a topic that is extremely relevant today, energy, strengthening energy resilience in cities, and it is being moderated by my colleague, Aida Sitikova. Please, Aida and panelists, if you come to the stage, thank you. Morning. Hi. Good to see you. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Good morning. Nice to Good to see you. <sighs> Musical chairs. <right? laughs> Good morning. Can you hear me? Well, I welcome you all to the plenary panel on strengthening energy resilience of cities, the key topic of today. We are all observing a double challenge of energy security and climate change. And as countries and cities take stock in the run-up to COP27, each is facing its unique challenges and opportunities. There is a common theme, however, especially in the EBRD region, where the post-COVID recovery has been blighted by the unprecedented geopolitical tensions, which returned energy security to the fore with, and joined it as climate, uh, climate change as, its, as a top concern. So currently we have, um, we have a situation where, uh, which compels national and local governments to rethink maybe their COP26 commitments and choose between financial support for energy resilience or climate resilience. Well, we at the BRD think it's not mutually exclusive. We firmly believe that energy resilience and climate resilience are closely interdependent. And through this session, we would like to explore how best we can achieve a balanced and sustainable growth with addressing both energy and climate resilience together. Today we would like to discuss and exchange our views on strengthening energy resilience of cities and which technological or financial instruments can enable us to achieve this target. Over half of the world population lives in cities. These are, the cities are major contributors to climate change, but they're also a major, could be a major force for decarbonization on the road to the global net zero by mid-century. Cities are, of course, crucial and critical. They offer employment, education, economic growth, cultural exchanges, and so much more, all for the life of their citizens. I am delighted to have an esteemed panel with, of stakeholders from a very diverse ge geography of EBRD region, from mayors and city administration, administrations to critical infrastructure and service providers to uh, an intergovernmental organizations like IEA, um, this promises to be an interesting exchange of experiences and outlooks um, and also on the technological and financial instruments that could support this outlook. Please join me uh, in welcoming on stage His Excellency Governor of Alexandria, Major General Mohammed El Sayed Tahir El Sharif. Mr. Dominic Fritz, Mayor of Timisoara, Romania. Mr. Erion Vileac, Mayor of Tirana, Albania. Mr. Murat Pinar, CEO of Energisa Energy, Turkey. <laughs> and last but not least, Melanie Slade, Ms. Melanie Slade, Senior Sector Expert of the International Energy Agency. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. In terms of housekeeping, we'll try to have a two rounds of questions, asking speakers to keep your interventions to three, four minutes, five maybe at max. Uh, my colleague Nigel <coughs> will help with, with running questions after the panel, and the questions will be open to the audience as well as online. Please go to www.slider.com and use the code GREEN2022, or you can scan the QR code, um, and online attendees can post their questions there. So without further ado, um, Your Excellency, let's start with Egypt. The host of COP27 coming in, what, just two weeks in Sharm el-Sheikh. And as the world looks at the global climate situation, we know that Alexandria is facing significant resilience, climate resilient challenges. For example, a changing climate sea and sea level rises is a major, major concern. So with COP approaching, um, and Egypt having an opportunity to showcase its work in climate action. Could you probably describe the key policies that you use to promote energy and climate resilience of Alexandria? Thank <laughs> you. والسيد محافظ فيينا ولكل الساده الحاضرين وسعيد بوجودي معاكم لاني كان يهمني جدا اكون متواجد نيابه عن محافظه الاسكندريه وجمهوريه مصر العربيه. خليني في البدايه اوضح ان التغيرات المناخيه خلال السنوات الماضيه وخلال السنوات القادمه تؤثر فينا جميعا وفي معظم دول العالم ومن بينها دولة مصر اللي هي تعتبر الدولة رقم 20 على مستوى العالم معرضة للخطر ومحافظة الاسكندرية العاصمة الثانية والعاصمة الاقتصادية لمصر تعتبر المدينة رقم خمسة على مستوى العالم ولا ننسى ما قاله السيد رئيس وزراء بريطانيا السابق عن تعرض الاسكندرية للغرق خلال العشرين أو الثلاثين سنة القادمة في نتيجة التغيرات المناخية محافظة الأسكندرية التي أشرف أننا بصفتي محافظا لها تعد أقدم سكندريات العالم مدينة الأسكندرية بها أقدم شارع في التاريخ وأقدم شارع في البشرية فهي مدينة عريقة قديمة ممتلئة بالآثار البطلمية والفرعونية والرومانية واليونانية والقبطية والإسلامية فهي مدينة ذات أهمية خاصة ليست لمصر فقط ولكن للعالم أجمع مدينة ذات طابع خاص وطابع فريد والتغييرات المناخية أثرت عليها تأثيرا واضحا خلال السنوات السابقة ومن المتوقع وفق الأبحاث العالمية أن تؤثر عليها تأثيرات ضخمة جدا خلال السنوات القادمة بتتبع آثار التغييرات المناخية على محافظة الأسكندرية لوحظ منذ عام 1944 زيادة منسوب سطح البحر بمليمترات كل عام ولكن خلال منذ التسعينات بدأت زيادة هذا المنسوب إلى سنتيمترات كثيرة ويخشى خلال السنوات القادمة أنها ممكن أن تزداد في فترة قريبة إلى 65 سنتيمتر في العام الواحد وهذه نتيجة أبحاث عالمية وليست كلام المحافظ إذا هناك تآكل في شواطئ المدينة هناك نحر في شواطئ المدينة هناك تعرض المدينة لمخاطر عديدة كيف أثرت التغيرات المناخية على مصر بشكل عام وعلى محافظة الإسكندرية بشكل خاص؟ درجات الحرارة اختلفت تماما عن الدرجات التي اعتدنا عليها فالبرودة ازدادت بشكل كبير جدا درجات الحرارة ازدادت بشكل كبير جدا كميات الأمطار أصبحت كبيرة جدا وليست المعتادة على عروس البحر الأبيض المتوسط الأجواء ودرجات الرطوبة تغيرت تماما ولها تأثيرات سلبية على كل نواحي الحياة في محافظة الإسكندرية كل هذا تتعرض له الإسكندرية نتيجة التغيرات المناخية ماذا فعلت الدولة المصرية وكيف نستعد 
للتغيرات المناخية خلال السنوات السابقة عددنا خطط وليس خطة واحدة على مستوى الجمهورية بشكل عام وعلى مستوى الإسكندرية بشكل خاص ويمكن خلينا إحنا الانبعاثات الكربونية الناتجة عن دولة مصر على مستوى العالم نص في الماء نصف في الماء وهي نسبة ضئيلة جدا ولكن نحن دولة مضارة جدا مثل الدول العربية والأفريقية وبناء عليه إحنا بنعمل في العديد من النواحي أولها إن إحنا إزاي نتكيف مع التغيرات المناخية وخططنا للتغيرات المناخية وكيفية التعامل معها خلال السنوات القادمة ثم ماذا نفعل لتقليل الانبعاثات التي هي نصف في الماء إزاي نقللها عملنا كل ما تحتاجه الأسكندرية كان أهم حاجة نبدأ بها هو حماية شواطئ الأسكندرية ولذلك أنفقنا خلال عامين مليار و600 مليون جنيه في عام مشاريع حواجز مائية على البحر الأبيض المتوسط ونحتاج إلى مليار و950 مليون جنيه لثلاث مشاريع أخرى ولكن عندنا المشروع الذي تم الانتاء منه بالفعل وهو حماية وحفاظ على أثر يهم العالم أجمع وهو الحفاظ على قلعة قاية باي الأسرية فتم إحاطتها بحواجز مائية لحمايتها خلال السنوات القادمة من ارتفاع منسوب المياه ومن الأمواج العالية جدا التي تضر بمدينة الأسكندرية ولنقل أن مدينة الأسكندرية هي حائط الصد الشمالي لجمهورية مصر العربية الذي يجب أن يحمي شواطئه من النحر الذي وضح خلال العشر سنين الأخيرة شكرا شكرا Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving us um, this very colorful background on, on the city of Alexandria, its cultural legacy, but also the stark picture of what the climate change is doing uh, to the coastal line and um, to the continent, frankly, because, no, because Alexandria is a northern barrier. Um, moving on to Europe, which is represented by two cities today, it's Timisoara and Tirana. <clears throat> and of course, Europe will be on the receiving end of the acute energy crisis this coming winter. Uh, the European Union launched the Repower EU plan, uh, which we all heard of, in order to sort of help Europe reshape its energy space. So we have three pillars of it. We have replace Russian gas with alternative sources. We have reduce, which is energy efficiency, reduce energy consumption. And we have renew. We have the scale up of renewables and acceleration of their deployment. I have to say, Repower EU does not change the long-term uh, goal of the European Green Deal target. And we still have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. So, Dominic, let's start with uh, Timisoara. The city of Timisoara is developing its Green City Action Plan. Uh, initial findings show that there is a high potential of renewables deployment in the country and um, in, in the county, especially in the solar, geothermal, I understand, and biomass. Could you please describe your key policies, um, your, your objectives and in, in terms of energy and climate resilience, and as well as full utilization of the renewables potential that you have in the county? Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot. G good morning. For us, really, the, the big challenge right now is, is to find a good balance between short-term and, and long-term investments and, and policies. Uh, we have a public heating system in, in Timisoara, where all the public institutions, hospitals, schools, uh, and about 50,000 private households are still connected to. And uh, obviously our plan was to get rid of coal because we, we had been using coal uh, to, to make our public heating system running. Um, and now obviously in this crisis, you know, we started buying coal again and, and we're burning on a cold uh, winter's day. We're burning one or two trains of coals and we're waiting with uh, great anxiety for the deadline next April when we have to pay for all the, the emission certificates for, for the coal we're using now because we don't want to freeze. Um, we're, we're not yet sure how, how we will be able to, to pay for it, but, but then we don't have a choice. Um, and, and so for us, it's, it's really about finding this right mix of, of short-term and, and long-term uh, solutions. 
uh, and and there we have to be radically pragmatic, uh, and and sometimes it, it 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 really hurts to to be that pragmatic. Uh, we're obviously we're now uh, investing into uh, different kinds of of heating production, geothermal, uh, coal generation, where at least we also produce electricity and not just uh, uh, heating. Uh, biomass and uh, um, and also uh, photovoltaics. Uh, um, the problem really is that these are long-term investments, and uh, we will have the first results in in maybe a year or two or three. And we we have to really keep the people in the system because if if they all leave our public heating system because it's too expensive, because it's uh, the quality is not good enough, because it's not warm enough, literally, uh, then they will all resort to uh, even more polluting uh, systems and kind of personal uh, apartment gas uh, heatings and, and so on. So this is our challenge. And this is, I think, really also a, um, a communications challenge. Uh, and, and I guess my message uh, today is that that I'm not I'm not a technocrat. I, I don't have the luxury of looking simply at all the facts and and you know making some calculations and then draw a line and then picking the best solution. Um, I'm a politician. I have to build majorities around those solutions, uh, and uh, and this is my my most important job. I have to build political majorities. I have to build uh, uh, um, in in the society, in the local community. I have to build majorities for for those solutions, and uh, you know we, we don't need consensus. We will never have consensus, especially if it's about more transitional policies. Um, but we need we need strong coalitions, and citizens need to understand that it's not about. Uh, just some technical changes. It's not about some abstract long-term thing about climate change, but it's really about their uh, their lives in the here and now. And I think this is also the great chance of this crisis now that these uh, these two poles that we that we you know debated about ecology versus economy now they really converge and now finally people understand that uh, the most uh, ecological and climate friendly solutions are in the medium and long term also uh, uh, the, the the most economic solutions and they feel it in their own in, in their own pocketbook so this is really a, I, I think it's it's a great opportunity also for us politicians to to forcefully sell the right solutions and to build coalitions around them. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. Um, I, I have to say, for a non-technocrat, you do have a radical pragmatism in your speech. And uh, of course, we are very acutely aware of the crisis. And the governor uh, told us what's happening with the actual impacts of climate change already now. Um, it's, it, is, it is a tough job to reconcile and balance. So continuing with the same topic of energy security and resilience while keeping the eye on the longer term climate agenda. Over to Arian. Arian Tirana had its share of shocks recently as well, uh, from earthquakes, then was COVID pandemic. What policies have you put in place uh, to make the city as resilient as possible and um, to be able to face those future shocks? Thank you. I started this work in 2015 and I'd been in the job for a month and uh, realized there was a drought. It hadn't rained for 181 days. And of course, at City Hall and in all of our offices, you're surrounded with experts, right? So the experts say, well, Mr. Mayor, once in 100 years, we have a drought like this. So it just happened to be on your first year, but you're going to be fine. It's going to rain eventually. So um, my second year, uh, it rained so much. They, they were right but it was flooded everywhere. Uh, I mean, from downtown to the periphery, to the rural areas, we were we literally felt I was the mayor of Venice for, for a year. Um, and then again, the experts always have a response. So, well, Mr. Mayor, rain like this, we've been looking at the encyclopedias once in 100 years, once a century we have rainfall like this, it's, it's eventually gonna stop and you're gonna be completely fine. And I said, okay, well, fine. Uh, third year, uh, there were bushfires everywhere. I mean, like literally everything was burning. It felt like I was uh, working on a pizza oven. You know? um, and the whole crown of the city, the hills that you see uh, on, the, on the picture to the left, full of fires. I mean, literally felt like a one big Burning Man party everywhere in the, in the city. 
Uh, and, but it was burning at the same time in California and Australia. So people were looking at the international news and listening to the foreign experts who said, well, once in 100 years, you have fires like this that really ravage everything. And, uh, and I was like, you know, how unlucky can one be, you know? And then on the fifth year, on the, sorry, on the fourth year, uh, it snowed. Now, Albania sits in the Mediterranean. It's not like Timisoara continental. It never snows in the Mediterranean, right? And um, it snowed that year. In, it hadn't snowed since uh, I was a kid in the 80s. And then again, the experts were, well, look, you know, once in 100 years, even in, in the Mediterranean, it does snow. So, of course, all the favorite trolls, which every mayor has its share, and all the trolls were like, so where are the snow plowers? And I said, what snow plows? You know, we don't live in, in Michigan or in Canada. We, we live in the Mediterranean. I'm going to purchase snow plows for just uh, once in 100 years snow. And then on um, our fifth year, we had this major, major earthquake. And it ravaged huge parts of the city, especially the old stuff uh, that was built cheaply with very uh, low knowledge and low materials, cheap materials during the communism years, were mostly political prisoners or volunteers. So you had a composer, a historian, a diplomat, and a teacher, each building their own apartment. Uh, a bit more complicated than building, playing Lego, right? So it ravaged huge parts of the city. And then the experts, again, they always appear in every crisis. And they say, well, you know, the last earthquake of this magnitude was 1905. So literally, once in 100 years, the tectonic plates, you know, stretch, and then we have this. And I said, go, where does it stop? And of course, we had the pandemic which literally happens once in 100 years since the Spanish <laughs> flu in 1918. Uh, and then now, sadly, we have a war. I know everyone has been dancing around the terminology, but it is a war, let's face it. And uh, it hadn't happened since the time of, uh, of our grandparents. And no one thought we'd ever live in Europe and see those atrocities and that type of conflict um, again. So two ways to go around it. One is to sort of look at yourself in the mirror and say, what the hell is going on? And actually, some guy did this. It was President Johnson. He, um, he was interviewed and he was asked, how did he survive all the conflict? Now, they killed Kennedy, they killed Martin Luther King, all the civil strife, civil unrest everywhere. So Lyndon Johnson would say, well, the way I survived it, I said uh, every night I'd brush my teeth, wear my pajamas, look at myself in the mirror and say, Lyndon, take courage. You could have been the mayor. It was always worse. So that's one way to do it, uh, which doesn't work if you're actually the mayor. Or the second way, and I think this is my serious note, is to see every crisis as an opportunity. I don't think we've put uh, more bike lanes, not just stripes on the street, but proper bike lanes with protected corridors uh, than we did during the pandemic. And I think this was a way to go on fifth gear on a lot of the policies that we had planned and we're happy to be one of the first, if not the first, city to participate in the Green City Action Plan with the BRD. I don't think we've uh, planted more trees than we actually did during the earthquake recovery. I don't think we've planned better neighborhoods, uh, not the 15-minute city, the five-minute city. Why should you take the car to go to the pharmacy or the bakery or the kindergarten or the nursery? The new neighborhoods that we planned were all with this idea that you should be able to get 95% of your stuff done within the vicinity and not necessarily uh, getting into a, a car. And I think, to conclude this first intervention, this huge conflict war um, in Ukraine and crisis with uh, fuel, with energy, is again a fantastic opportunity. When we started with these bike lanes or the car-free days, everybody, you know, again, these experts, oh, but Mr. Mayor, we're not Netherlands or we're not uh, Denmark. This is not Amsterdam or Copenhagen. And most people forget that until 1973, with the OPEC oil crisis, Copenhagen was not Copenhagen either, and Amsterdam was not Amsterdam either. But a bunch of urban planners and mayors were bold enough to say, look, we can whine and complain, or we can say this is a great opportunity to shift, to shift. And sometimes the way the, the shift is done is not with the usual advocates, definitely not with the experts who just specialize in telling that every crisis is packed in your mandate. Um, sometimes the most unusual advocates, and we as politicians, you said we're politicians, to a certain extent we are, uh, we are trained to only think of uh, taxpayers and voters, which automatically excludes everyone under 18, right? So some of our top advocates were children. You can always be suspicious 
of your politicians, but you cannot be suspicious of your child. So if it's kids taking the bikes, kids planting trees, kids uh, organizing car-free spaces, then it's only a matter of time when the parents join and this becomes a societal change. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, they're very inspirational and uh, you might think yourself unlucky. I call it a steep learning curve and that's what sort of sets you for such a, such a pragmatic and ambitious outlook into the future, take uh, opportunities from any challenges. So interesting insights from us. Now let's hear from sector stakeholder. As a representative of the energy sector myself, I'm particularly pleased to know that our green cities are making inroads into the sustainable urban energy. Um, EBRD is supporting the city of Gaziantep, uh, solar PV installations, of course, bringing energy savings and supply of clean energy to the grid, while alleviating fiscal pressures on the budget, on the city budget. Or our facility with the electricity networks of Armenia, uh, modernization of the distribution network and introduction of smart metering, and um, targeting two um, largest cities of Armenia, Yerevan and Gyumri, Again, improving energy efficiency, losses reduction, increasing resilience to power system, of the power system, and of course, enabling um, integration of intermittent renewables on a larger scale. These are all EBRD green cities, of course. So st sticking with the resilient energy theme, I now go to Murad Bey, uh, CEO of Energisa Electricity Distribution, largest electricity distribution uh, corporate in Turkey, uh, with presence in many regions. And uh, it's a corporate blue chip, a long-standing client of the bank uh, who is now looking into innovative solutions, integrated energy solutions, EV charging, immobility, rooftop solar combined with, with their conventional electricity distribution networks business. Murat, cities need access to appropriate technology to ensure this resilience. What specific technologies are you looking at to, 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 and you think the most critical for promoting energy resilience in the cities you operate? Uh, let's start with like that, just uh, where we are living now, why we need those technologies. The last two decades, we as a businessman, we talk about VUCA world, means volatile, anxious, something. But now, after two decades, every crisis in the crisis, several loops over there. I don't want to talk details, everybody knows financial, economical, war, energy crisis, all of them together at the same time. And New World defining for, or just explaining their self as a the brittle, as a fragile, let's say, the anxious, uh, non-linear and incomprehensible. I'm, uh, I'm really, uh, let's say, using F1, just fragile, funny world. We are in funny world now especially for the Intel, uh, energy agency, International Energy Agency, just giving some uh, hints regarding with what's, what's our future. If we just promise to keep zero, uh, carbon zero target at 2050, means each and every day, each and every day, 1,000 megawatt uh, new renewable energy we have to install. Otherwise, there is no way. If you compare what's our performance now as a world, it's ha ha less than half. Means we cannot create a solution for the future with only one technology, one part of it. Second, the, of course, it just as a positive uh, news, we have technologies, even now commercialized, even at the, let's say, uh, research site, we have. Even hydrogen, less, less 10 years we will see, last 10 years also. But again, it's not only for energy businesses or sectors or investors can handle this problem. Because what is the energy problem at the beginning? First, security of supply. It's directly resource demanded. Second, cost. Cost of electricity or energy. Third, quality. Those three, it's a, dilemma, a trilemma of energy. Let's look at our position. Which part is solved now? No one. No. <laughs> <laughs> because of this reason, 
how we can solve the problems for future, at, at least for the energy. Because we, if we are talking about green cities, if we are talking about sustainability, if we are talking about climate, means we have some bigger problems than today. But how can we solve? First, research institutes, academies, policymakers, regulatory uh, owners, or municipalities, mayors, we have to work together. Otherwise, there is no smart city, there is no green city. We have to work together. Even collaboration, even co co uh, coalition, or as Dominic mentioned, just it's a hard job. Additional, uh, I don't want to say that one, but the finance. Now, why EBRD is here? If there is no financing, how they will solve the problems? Which one is priority highest? Because of I mentioned that, it's a funny world. And uh, what's the, do you know, uh, the, from Anatolia, uh, 13th century, Rumi, he mentioned that. All gone with the day, whatever, what is the belongings, now we have to say new things. Of course, we are dealing with all the, uh, let's say, panels, discussions, uh, coming together, workshops, but again, we have to work together, otherwise there is no way. Technology is ready, believe me, I'm just following up them, and we are running money from there, but really collaboration, even international, not regarding with the country by country or something, because each and every city here, dynamics is different. 5D, for the world trends of the energy, but each and every city, their own dynamics, they have to cross their uh, trends and dynamics together and they can find their own solutions. There is no other way. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Marve. From, from fragile, incomprehensible and funny yes. world to, to the energy trilemma, to the uh, security of supply, quality of supply, affordability, and finally to working together. Yes. Yeah, I couldn't have put it better. Um, it would be logical to conclude with the input from a highly respectable global think tank, real experts, okay? So over to Melanie uh, from IA. Um, what role can institutions like the IA play in helping cities and governments to improve their resilience to shocks. Over to you, Melanie. Thank you very much. And um, it's a real honor to be here amongst people who are really on the front line. Um, but we at the IEA are um, really um, keen to synthesize experience like this, make sure that we share those, make sure that we build on those. So um, <clears throat> we have been at the forefront of the international response to the energy crisis we're currently faced with. Um, and um, we're really committed to providing governments with advice to con make sure that we can continue to supply secure, affordable, sustainable energy for citizens all over the world. So um, one of the things that we've done in recent times is um, produced two 10-point plans, um, and there'll be others to follow. But the first one was a plan, an emergency plan to cut oil use. And a lot of this is relevant to, to cities. Um, many of, uh, much of oil use is transport, and, and, and a lot of the opportunities to do something about this lies within cities. And we've seen, or we've heard some great examples already today, things like reducing the cost of public transport, the cycle lanes that you talked about investing in during the COVID years. Um, these are all the sorts of measures that we need to see in not just a few cities, but in, in all cities in order to, to uh, resolve these problems. Um, things like working from home, car-free Sundays, <coughs> all those sorts of things, bringing together lots of very small actions to have really large impacts. The second of the 10-point plans was um, to uh, quickly reduce Europe's dependence on gas, of course. Um, and here, there's a clear focus on energy efficiency. So improving the efficiency of our buildings, our appliances, um, replacement of uh, gas boilers with heat pumps, um, enacting short-term measures to try and um, shelter vulnerable communities and people from the shocks of high prices. 
And here also we've able to, as, as, as you said, you know, capitalize on the opportunities to think about behavior change. Because in these very emotional times, we can appeal to people to do things differently and to, and to change behavior in a way that's been difficult sometimes in the past. Um, and one of our core, core principles is that we want to try and make sure that these, these urgent actions be, um, are, have long-term impacts. So if they're well-designed, they can lead to long-term, high-quality local jobs. Um, they can, as we've already heard, lead to improved health through reduced air pollution. Um, and they, of course, contribute to resilience and, and energy security. And we want to make sure that we use this, this, this crisis um, to actually build the infrastructure that we need for the long term, not just respond to the crisis. So make sure the decisions that are taken um, aren't just knee-jerk reactions. Um, sadly, having to use more coal, you know, trying to make sure that we take the opportunities to invest in, in, the, in that long term. Um, one, one opportunity that's coming to the forefront, and, and uh, as you just described, is, is the digitalization of everything. Um, and so, of course, the density of activity in cities lends itself to digitalization, lends itself to aggregating large numbers of small, small activities, um, which together have a huge impact. Um, and, and building on that premise, uh, we had our... Um, seventh annual Global Energy Efficiency Conference this year in the city of Sonderburg in Denmark. Um, today is Denmark, not the Denmark of, of, of 20 years ago, of course. And um, on that occasion, we took the opportunity to publish some policy packages for promoting energy efficiency across a lot of sectors, um, which I, I hope people will find useful, but one of them is specifically on smart and efficient cities. And that's trying to pull together all of this experience that we see and, and make some recommendations for, that others, others can follow. Um, and just, just, just one f final point. We, analysis from the uh, Coalition for Urban Transition says that basically national governments um, can, can respond, have the carriage of about 30% of uh, emissions. Local governments, another 30%. But collaboration between the two, the final 30%. So it leads us in the, you know, to, to, to remember that we need to collaborate both locally, but as you said, we also need to collaborate internationally. And uh, just, just to end with saying that the International Energy Agency is really keen to, to work with you more. Uh, tell us what sort of analysis would be helpful. Um, and we're there to support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. I particularly um, I was interested in the fact of the power of the behavioral shifts and the collective response and the collective action and how, how long term those actions could be at the end of the day if, if we do change. Digitalization is another interesting subject. So we're moving to our part two, which is, the, um, is about investments and who will finance. And of course, if I, we haven't said so, I think Carrie mentioned it, we're, there, we're here to support the cities, to support our corporate clients with, the, with addressing the dual challenge. Global energy investments are expected to be up by 8% this year, 2022. So they will be well above the pre-COVID levels. And from the people like IA, we're hearing uh, it will be, I don't know, 2.4 trillion US dollars. Um, the large chunk of it will be eaten up by higher costs rather than the actual capacity installed. There will be issues with supply chain, with access to specialized labor and services, with, of course, energy prices impact on construction materials like steel and cement. But at the same time, clean energy investments are expected to stay at 1.4 trillion. And um, we want maybe staying with Melanie. How, how much of that, if, if you can help us with any numbers, will be spent on cities, how much the cities need to invest or are expected to invest to stay on the IEA trajectory towards net zero. Thank you again. <clears throat> and um, you've used a lot of my numbers, so I'll, I'll have to come up with some new ones. But just to, just to say, to, according to the IEA net zero um, emissions scenario, to reach um, net zero emissions by 2050, um, globally, en uh, energy investment needs to, needs to triple. Um, over the next 10 years. So we're looking, we need, we're looking at, at a need um, of $4 trillion a year. And as you say, we need, we need to, we need to, we're at something like 1.4. Um, 
That investment would be something like, um, at the moment we have about 1.3 million electric vehicle charging units globally, and that would have to go up to 40 million units. Um, deep building retrofits need to double by 2030. Um, and solar B PV capacity would rise 20-fold by 2050. But important to note that those shorter term things are the energy efficiency ones. We need to see the investments in energy efficiency be between now and 2030 to make the rest of the plan achievable, affordable. Um, and of course, this is in the context of rising electricity demand in developing and emerging economies, which is absolutely essential um, in order to improve standards of living. Um, and so we, we need to make sure that that new investment um, is, is, in, is, in the, is in renewables. So we need to do what we can with energy efficiency, with the existing infrastructure, build it in for the long term, as we said earlier, but then um, um, make sure that the, any, any additions are renewable. Energy efficiency will make that transition affordable, uh, and without it, we, we couldn't do it. Um, I think, as you said, about half of the... Um, in, increase in investment that we're seeing this year will, will, will disappear in, in, in higher prices. So, the, you know, it's, it's, it's a much smaller increase than we would ideally have, uh, have seen. Um, so, the kind of, the, 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 the good things that we've seen are um, a lot of governments have had um, resilience packages that have been spurred on by trying to spur economies post-COVID, and a lot of that money's gone into buildings. So we have seen uh, an increase in efficiency of, of buildings. Um, we have seen record sales of heat pumps, for example. But of course, we are also seeing the supply chain struggling to, to meet the demand. So there's got to be a lot of work and investment in those supply chains too. And the progress is uneven. So we're seeing um, more progress in, 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 in some parts of the world than others, and the, the progress is particularly low in the, in the large emerging and developing economies. Um, things like adoption of you know, building codes and, and measures that we, we know work really well are much lower in some parts of the world than others. Um, it, it, interestingly, electric vehicle sales reached an all-time high in, in China and Europe, but are really, really still quite low in places like the US and Japan. So it's not just an emerging and um, versus developing world scenario. It, it's, it's a mixture of things depending on the technology. And um, you asked about cities, but of course, in, in investing in city level action is at, at the front line. Um, it helps us um, make sure that we have that, we can aggregate those, those multiple investments and um, targeted funding models. Uh, piloting things in cities, has, of course, has been extremely important, but we do need to, to, to see those scaled up. Um, we see lots of pilots, lots of really successful experiments, but, but the scale's still missing. Um, and of course, the Green Cities program that brings us here today is the shining example of, of how to try and work on that aggregation from, from the pilots. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Melanie. And indeed, I was, thank you for mentioning our Green Cities. Indeed, it's a great platform to take forward the low hanging fruit of energy efficiency this side of 2030, as you mentioned. So we are ready to really scale up once the world is out of the crisis. Um, Alexandria joined Green Cities in 2019. Um, Your Excellency, the city of Alexandria is about to start its GCAP implementation, Green Cities Action Plan implementation. What are the main challenging opportunities? And most importantly, how do you expect the Green Cities Action Plan to unlock climate finance? كما تحدث مع الخبراء عن الاقتصاد، تحدث مع خبراء التاريخ عن الاسكندريه، وابلغوني انها سبق ان غرقت مرتين بينهما 750 عاما، سالت الخبراء هل كان هناك تغييرات مناخيه منذ 1500 عام ولم تكن هناك اجابه. الإسكندرية مدينة تاريخية ومن المهم جدا زي ما قلت إن إحنا نحافظ عليها الدولة المصرية بشكل عام اتخذت عشرات 
المبادرات بدأت فيها بفعل منذ عدة سنوات لتكون المدن المصرية مدن خضراء ومحافظة الإسكندرية بشكل خاص أخذت العديد من الإجراءات بدأنا فيها بالفعل رغم أن مصر الحقيقة لم تكن Despite the fact that Egypt was not a main factor let's say in the carbon emissions the emissions are not more than 0.05 percent but the measures we took were very strong ones and we already started implementing them first of all to protect our coastal areas from very strong waves and tsunamis let's say we also uh, changed many of our public transportations to be electrically powered. The most recent project was a month ago we bought 40 electric buses. In fact, most of our street lights now are being changed and replaced by ones working with uh, powered with solar energy. And months ago, and thanks to the participation of the European Union, we have uh, constructed the first uh, commercial mall uh, for vegetables and fruits, and it uses uh, solar energy. And we have also آخرها الأسبوع الماضي كان مبادرة الإسكندرية بلا أكياس بلاستيكية وحادية الاستخدام لدينا العديد من المحترفين والغواصين بنستخدمهم في جمع القمامة والأكياس البلاستيكية من شواطئ البحر الأبيض المتوسط على مستوى محافظة الإسكندرية الحقيقة العديد أو العشرات من المبادرات بنعمل عليها حاليا لتقليل الانبعاثات وللحماية الاسكندرية ولنقل اخيرا ان احنا بدأنا في مشروع زراعة مليون شجرة في مدينة الاسكندرية امام جميع المدارس وجميع الجهات التنفيذية والمصالح الحكومية وده امر اهم جدا كل المبادرات اللي بنعمل عليها دي لتقليل كم الانبعاثات الكربونية اللي احنا سبق أن ذكرنا أنها كمية قليلة جدا شكرا شكرا Thank you, thank you um, Indeed we, we will move to the next city Dominic um, Timisoara joined Green Cities Action Plan in 2022 um, You're currently mm -hmm. developing GCAP um, I know you've recently invested in the city's uh, tram infrastructure together, and I think with support of VBRD and other uh, IFIs. Um, could you maybe briefly mention what worked well, you think, and what could be improved on a financing um, of pro such projects in the future? Yeah, thanks a lot. I think, first of all, it's important to notice that, that right now we're not uh, we don't have a shortage of uh, financing uh, mm -hmm. mechanisms. I, I mean, Romania is now, we now have doubled the, the financing from, from EU grants, for example, for the next seven years compared to the last seven years. And so it's really a question also about the absorption capacity of our administrations. And, and so we're really grateful in working with, with EBRD for, I think, for, for, for uh, two things. Uh, first of all, that with the Green City Action Plan, there's really a, um, a, a coherent approach um, to integrate all those different projects. Because what we're seeing is we're really kind of, sometimes we're struggling with uh, with aligning all those different projects with different funding sources into a single uh, strategy and vision, and, and this is where, where EBRD is helping us. Also, for example, when, when we talk about our, our tram project, where we basically we, we try to, um, to renew our whole fleet of, of trams because our public transport system is, in terms of quality, really low. But what we notice is that um, actually it's not just the quality of the, the vehicle itself, 
but there's a lot of other questions about the ticketing system, about the management, about how client-friendly and passenger-friendly uh, the whole system works, where we need technical assistance, and, and the fact that eBRD comes in not just with money, but also uh, with any kind of technical help that our public transport company can be getting is really, really valuable, because at the end, again, it's not just the money that, that matters. Now, because you asked what, what can be improved, what, what I find that often we are uh, we need more flexibility in uh, in kind of eligibility criteria for certain projects, and I give you an example um, in terms of mobility and and urban mobility, and and I guess the ex the, the experience from from other mayors is, is the same. In order to, for example, get rid of cars on a certain street. Uh, in order to uh, build a new uh, extra lane for uh, the public bus uh, and, and, and kind of get rid of the cars on that street. Sometimes we need to build other car infrastructure. We need to build a, a road that where we can lead the transit traffic uh, through or in order to eliminate all the parking, public parking uh, in a certain neighborhood, we need to build uh, a, a parking garage. Uh, and unfortunately, what we find that a lot of times we're having trouble accessing for, for these kind of uh, additional uh, um, uh, project, accessing finance, and, and this is why we cannot go further with and, and cannot be more radical with transforming certain neighborhoods and, and kind of getting rid of, of, of cars and making more space for public transport and for, for pedestrian and, and uh, bicycle traffic. So, and, and this is where sometimes I would, I would wish that that our partners would see the, the bigger picture and would really see how uh, all our investments, even if it's in, in car infrastructure, are really connected and, and are part of a bigger vision of uh, reducing car traffic in the city. Thank you, thank you very much. I mean, some, and thank you for the honest feedback, which will be uh, taken away. It's not linear, of course, it's a, it's a complicated, uh, uh, it's a complicated setup, but that, as you said, EBRD is not just about money. I mean, this is why we are partnering up and continuing dialogue and very happy to continue discussing. So as long as it stays on, the, on this traje trajectory of decarbonization, of reducing emissions, I think there, there, there is common ground to be, to be found. Um, Erin, Tirana joined Green Cities in 2017, uh, adopted Action Plan 2018, um, and identified, I, I understand, 548 million <laughs> US dollars of investment needed to address the priority environmental challenges. That's a lot of money. So where do you think you will be raising this money? And what institutions like a BRD can help you? I love the questions I was provided. I mean, of, yes. <laughs> Over to you, Erin. Well, the simple question is uh, to rob a bank. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's probably not going to do very well with, for my career, so I have to think of another answer. But um, So I am the other European, but the non-EU European, so funding is not so available if you are the other European, meaning from the Western Balkans. Um, so, so that's a tricky question. I had a, I had a very funny guest uh, at the office yesterday, uh, Jim Belushi from the Blues Brothers. Oh. And uh, he's Albanian origin, as you probably know, Mother Teresa and Rita Ora and Dua Lipa and all the <laughs> famous people. Um, so, but there's this great line at, uh, at uh, the Blues Brothers, the, the movie. And the guy asks the bar owner, says, you know, how much for a gig? And they say, well, $5,000. And the answer is, well, what do you think you are, the Beatles? <laughs> you know, of course we're not going to have $5,000 for you. So I know that money is not readily available if you're not the Beatles. Uh, and if you're not an EU member. And if you're not... So the answer we get is, what do you think, you're Vienna or London? I said, no, sorry, we didn't invade anyone. We're not the center of an empire. We didn't colonize anyone. So our assets are limited to starting from scratch after the collapse of communism and uh, all the, the 10 biblical uh, plagues that I mentioned before. But I think there are creative ways uh, to go around it. So some of the funding we've received from EBRD uh, has been... Uh, directly going to city utilities and companies. So, for example, our water utility now is probably the regional front runner in terms of turning a company from the brink of bankruptcy. Now we've been asked from the government to take over some smaller utilities in other cities because of, of much better management that we did with the BRD. So it was not only the money, it was also the, the know-how. And then we wanted to take some money to, to get these two million trees that we had in our ambition plan. Um, then we realized 
because of budget constraints, because we're not an EU member and it's not so readily available. We said, this is something we can crowdsource because every kid in Tirana can pl plant a tree for their birthday. We will tell you exactly the GPS location where you can plant the tree, the type of tree that grows in that particular location that it's easier to maintain. And now we're approaching 980,000 trees. We will definitely reach December uh, up to a million. a million. And our ambition with GCAP is to be 2 million by 2030. So we are well ahead of uh, the halfway uh, mark. So this is just two examples that there are some things uh, money can buy. For everything else, there's a uh, MasterCard. No, I'm just kidding. For everything else, there's... <laughs> for this everything else. This is amazing stuff you're doing in Tirana. There's I mean, a way and, to and only you, it's a European uh, city and um, impressive. I, I'm thinking of switching career to municipal banking, probably. <laughs> I mean, this is really trees, I mean, bicycles, it, it's fascinating. But f from municipal financing to corporates, Murabi, you've been working with the BRD yes. for some time now. Um, you know we, how supportive we are of renewables, of smart grid solutions, of integrating what you do um, on, the, on, on providing those energy solutions with the recharging for social mobility. What can we do to support uh, us and other institutions like us, and maybe the commercial sector in Turkey, mm -hmm. with its depth of the market? Uh, it's a really good question, because also we change our strategy together with the EBRD, because before EBRD, we are just focusing on our core businesses first. But discussion with the EBRD, especially uh, 2019, we start with the green technologies, especially for the customer solution for the future COP26. You remember also, uh, it's a giving some uh, the cross-border tax for carbon something, and we just try to think and we discuss with you. And starting with the last quarter of uh, 2019 and last year, now the biggest exposure at the EBRD in Turkey is the Enersa. And for the next uh, three years, also we have a plan. We are working on it. I, I hope at just at the end of the year we will uh, complete one part of it. But also we are just focusing now really to, to 2027. We just, it, it, the same amount of uh, grid investment we will uh, do for the, let's say, the green investments. I mean, it's not only for the EBRD, of course, but also we are just starting to green bond uh, issuing at the locally. And also we are, uh, I'm also just leading at the EU Eurogia cluster for the carbon uh, footprint re reduction. Also, we are just dealing with the new innovative uh, projects. And also, we will invite you for the what's happening at the world, uh, even in Chile, Chile it's in, in, let's say, Korea. What's happening? I mentioned that each and every uh, the country's is dynamics is completely different. And depends on their dynamics, depends on where the cross, uh, the, uh, even there is sometimes there is no technology, as Ariel mentioned. It's just just uh, giving some uh, opportunity to children to, let's say, growing the trees. Uh, for example, at Bonte, in German, uh, the little, uh, let's say, town, and just 14,000 14, people is living there. And 2008, they have a one project, the smart city project, but not with technology, removing technology. All traffic lights just removing from the, uh, uh, let's say, town. Even, uh, let's say, just two, uh, let's say, smart rules they put, it, put in there. The first, you have to be lower speed than 50 kilometers per hour. Second, you have to be respect for men and uh, children, women and children, but you can uh, hit the men. <laughs> Then, after, <laughs> after, <laughs> after eight months, before the, uh, let's, say, uh, let's say, project, it was only 50 accident. It's not a high, by the way, even. But after project, there is no accident. And everybody just reaching their houses or, let's say, the offices 15 minutes before. Nice. What is the changing with the just smart rules? I mentioned that if you can put something like uh, smart environment, smart economy, smart finance, smart something, but if you cannot put the smart over there, it's not became a smart. We think reading again, as you mentioned. We're reading again. 
because of it's just finance, of course, we mentioned yeah. that also earlier mentioned, someone is not so easy to access the cash. Last 10 years, it was a bombing the money, all the markets, but after pandemic and the new energy crisis, just turning back to the central banks again. It's, it will be not uh, reachable or not easy to reach for the next uh, three years, in my opinion, at least. Mm -hmm. But we will continue with uh, work with EBRD if you also just support us. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. We're proud to have you as our largest exposure in, in Turkey. And um, um, really a lot to do um, with all the players presented here. Um, I'm, I'm, I have to say we're finishing our panel. Um, Please let me thank these distinguished speakers for the insights, for the um, experiences and outlook shared. And thank you very much. It was really a pleasure to moderate this panel. And I'm passing the floor to Nigel for questions. Mic on. Here we go. Thank you. Such a great panel. Thank you very much. So now we have a few minutes for questions. And we'll take questions, first of all, from the audience in the room. And then we have some questions that have come in through Slido. So please raise your hands, and I think we have some people with microphones who can give you the microphone. If not, we have a question uh, from Mike Henderson on Slido for Mel, actually, at the IEA. So um, his question is, the IEA highlights power of lots of small changes and actions. How do we package these to make them attractive to investors? Mel, over to you. I think that's a question for you, Nigel, actually. You're, <laughs> you're, you're the expert at that. So, yeah, there, there are, um, there's, a, there's a growing number of kind of business models that are being trialled for the aggregation uh, of small measures. Things like EBRDs, green technology selectors, a great version of that where, you know, if, if something's on a, on, a, on, a, on a list, then it can receive financing from generally local banks. So that's a great example. There are energy service companies who are doing this sort of aggregation approach as well. Um, in some countries, you're able to have intermediaries who aggregate projects and sell them into carbon trading schemes. So there are quite a lot of business models out there that have been successful. But, as I said earlier, it's the scale that we haven't yet seen. We haven't cracked that, so um, we, we need to work harder at it. But there are, there are models that are working well. Uh, we just need to bring that experience together. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. Do we have any um, questions in the room before we go back to Slido? So we'll go back to Slido. So a question um, to the mayor of Tirana, and I'll just read it out. Given the importance of spatial planning and focus on capital expenditure, how can there be better investment in urban design? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, we are now having a, um, a, co a neighborhood design competition, participatory uh, competition, where we're having some of the top architecture mentors uh, around Europe, Stefano Boeri, Vini Maas, um, some of the top architecture firms who've taken on neighborhood design and co-designing with, uh, with people. You've all seen those memes on the, on the internet, you know. The city does one route in the park, but everybody takes a shortcut. That's user design. So might as well start with user design from, from the very beginning rather than, you know, do everything in AutoCAD and then see how it plays out. So I think more and more cities are resorting to try storming rather than brainstorming. Sometimes you can brainstorm yourself to death and never sort of come with a conclusion, but it's much easier to sort of give it a try. You find out that... Uh, so a lot of habitats in, in the city, urban design, whether it's a bike lane, whether it's a park, uh, work like other habitats. So when we clean the Central Park Lake, all these wild geese and birds were coming in. And they're called indicative species. Humans also have indicative species. So when you see a lady on a bike uh, in a city that is notorious for car bullying and, 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 and terrible road rage, but when you see a lady on a bike uh, riding, you see pretty much an indicative species returning to the habitat and also certifying that the habitat is now safe, that you're not in danger of being uh, taken out. Um, and I think this type of city design is extremely helpful. Now, some things are also common sense. Uh, do people want to have a, a, a green yard 
everybody does. Is it possible? This continuous sprawl, which then takes a toll on our utilities. Then our water pipes have to go longer, our optic fibers have to go longer, our bus routes have to go longer, and we're killing green and uh, space. So for as much as people, and you see that's a, that's a picture of Tehran on the left, it's changed so much. This was a year ago. It's already changed. Um, but then you realize for cities like us that can't have access to the new tram line or the metro yet, then it's much better to densify. You kill air, but you don't kill green space. So sometimes common sense should prevail. I know everybody says, oh, not in my backyard. Yeah, but in whose backyard? This is our collective uh, backyard. So we have to make these decisions sometimes obliged given the shortage of funds and space rather than uh, you know, acting like we are in some sort of idealistic laboratory that simply does not exist. Thank you very much. So a question now to the, all panelists, and it really is at the heart of what EBRD is achieving. So what do you think would strengthen the public-private collaboration to scale up energy investments? So Aida, I leave it to you to nominate one of your panelists. What? Or two. OK. Well, <laughs> I, I'm looking for volunteers. <laughs> yeah. <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> Just the first, uh, I mentioned that regarding with the collaboration, first, what we need. Because uh, if we, especially Melanie mentioned, is efficiency. Because cheapest investment of energy, it's efficiency. Starting from there, more easier way, just low hanging fruits over there. But the second, regulation, why I mentioned, just, uh, you can say smart cities, but you have to uh, have a smart code, smart regulations first. Because day by day, we are improving ourselves. Because we have new ways, new technologies, but it's just, uh, let's say, putting somewhere and it's not working very well, just chaining again. Why we are just have to work together? Because of those reasons. Just we have to solve problems faster than before. Now we can wait the uh, just completion of, uh, or uh, let's say, improving our regula regulations or codes, but it's n there is no time anymore. Before we had, of course, just new technologies is coming, waiting for just developments, improvements, what else? But today, we are losing each and every day. We have to work together, tackle the issues first, and just solving problems, and just continue to work. There is no uh, way to lose the time anymore. Today's biggest problem, even we are thinking about six months ago, we are giving the right decision, but today we are just and they say, we should be like that or not. Still confusing. This time, we have to be careful, just coming together, solving together, and in, uh, execution together. Otherwise, there is no way. Again, I'm not just pessimist, but if we can work together, collaborate together, we can solve. Otherwise, you will see. Indeed, public private. Will it? Yes, please. Yeah, maybe, maybe just two uh, short thoughts. Um, first of all, I think it's really important that EBRD also accepts uh, a role as a lobbyist uh, with national governments, because often times we, we kind of uh, hit barriers that, that are not ours to solve and, and to overcome, um, and that are very difficult with our local uh, kind of resources, uh, legal and... and, and, and uh, regulatory resources that, that we just cannot solve. So, so we need governments and, and we need a really a clear legal framework for public-private partnerships that, that does not um, uh, make us vulnerable to, to all kinds of uh, accusations of robbing banks or, or, or other things. Um, and then uh, I think the, the second thing is, is, is maybe that, that I think we need to be careful not to um, I mean, we're not in the 90s anymore. I, I think this kind of overjoyous, uh, complete privatization of uh, some uh, public services, including in the energy uh, sector, I, I think we shouldn't return to those times. And, and it's really about, uh, you know, uh, having a private sector that can help us have stronger uh, cities and communities and public administrations but in the long term, it's it's really it, it, the the power literally has to remain in the in the hands of the people, uh, and uh, and and so I think also here 
maybe some of, of, of the lessons learned of some mistakes that have been made in the last 20, 30 years, um, maybe also by EBRD, um, uh, uh, you know, would, would be helpful so to not repeat uh, those mistakes? Some radical thinking here. Um, I think, I mean, some, some sectors and some subsectors within even the energy space do belong in private hands, first of all, in terms of efficiencies, in terms of who can best manage it. Some things are inherently monopolistic. Networks, transmission, high voltage transmission networks, you know, things like that, system operator, dispatch. And those are, of course, you know, have to say, in terms of the PPP's model itself, it's about the risk allocation. It's where, where and who is best placed to take, to take the risks. You mentioned lobbying. I wouldn't use the word lobbying. I mean, we're a policy partner. Um, we are known as broker, anecdotally, um, and we, we're trying, we're talking to the governments in terms of creating a level playing field for everybody, including through the PPP and advisory. So sorry just for jumping in with my answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, do you want to check with the rest of the panelists? Uh, yes, any more, Your Excellency? No? Okay. Okay, so um, just checking in the room, anyone? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. We have someone here, please. Someone. <laughs> Harry Boyd Carpenter. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a question about energy efficiency, which several of you mentioned, um, because I've never understood this. Pro I've never been able to solve this problem, and I have the experts, the real technocrats on the stage, which is, you know, we all know that energy efficiency is a big part of the solution, um, and we also know that it's in a way to improve the quality of buildings and the quality of the experience for your citizens. And it's also a way of generating local employment, local, in local economic activity, because energy efficiency happens on a street. You know, it's people replacing windows, it's people putting insulation in, and yet it doesn't happen. Um, a, a question I think particularly to the, to the free city leaders is, why not? What stops you investing even more heavily and even more extensively in energy efficiency? And what can we do to help? <laughs> well, it is, it is happening, uh, and it's happening, I mean, even yesterday, although we are awaiting the New Year's uh, budget, we already amended the existing budget because of the rise of concrete and, and cement and the rise of steel and iron, a lot of our initial investments could just not happen because the prices skyrocketed. So immediately we transferred uh, the funds uh, of unused investment or, or new unused investment funds to something we call the community fund, which is a 50-50 deal where for each uh, building we will pay um, half of the bill uh, for any retrofitting of the building, solar panels, uh, whatever will lower the energy uh, bill, you know, common water deposit, you know, any of that. It has been our most successful project to date. And the fact that we had to top up the fund, that means that we are more projects that we could, uh, we could uh, fund. Now, you guys have entered into the game, uh, EBRD, where now for large industrial scale, uh, developers can also access uh, funds, which are co-financed by a local bank and EBRD, in which a future new building, because now, of, because of the earthquake actually, we had to upgrade our uh, building codes and include and, and, and rely heavily on, on uh, energy efficiency policies. And therefore, many of them can then get some extra funding for their future building because of this mechanism. Why 50-50? Broken window theory. If it, if it belongs to the state, everybody you know, trashes it. Uh, no one vandalizes a building that community members have uh, already contributed, uh, even uh, a, a share of it. So it is happening. Should it happen uh, more? I think so. But I think there are some, uh, some great examples out there and for cities to, to replicate. If I just very quickly respond, that, that's also an example of the public-private partnership you exactly. were asking about. Yeah, the essence of it, absolutely. Governor, anything from your, your Excellency? Anything no. from your side on in terms of following Harry's question? Energy efficiency in Alexandria. It's not cold, but where where are the sources of energy efficiency? Mm. اولا شكرا على هذا السؤال الهام جدا ودوله مصر الحقيقه مهتمه في الاعوام الاخيره في مجال الطاقه وخاصه الطاقه المتجدده ودائما المشاريع الكبرى بتقوم بها الدوله بشكل عام 
وتتولى مسؤوليتها مسؤولية متكاملة خلينا نتكلم عن محطة طاقة المتجددة الطاقة الشمسية في بنبان وهي رابع أكبر محطة في العالم وهي لإنتاج الطاقة النظيفة وقامت عليها بالكامل الدولة ولم تكن هناك شراكة من الاستثمارات أو المستثمرين وده اللي خلى فخامة رئيس الجمهورية في العديد من اللقاءات على مدار الشهور الماضية أمر بمشاركة القطاع الخاص والمستثمرين اللي في الطاقة المتجددة ولكن خلينا دائما المستثمرين ورجال الأعمال دائما بيبحثوا عن الربح الضخم وربما هذه المشروعات ليس هناك فيها أرباح مالية ضخمة ولكن فيها فوائد لصالح الدولة ولصالح الشعوب ولذلك لا نجد إقبال قوي من المستثمرين خاصة لأنهم يبحثوا عن ربح ولكن لدينا العديد من المشروعات والإسمارات في محافظة الإسكندرية بخصوص الطاقة المتجددة من يرغب سواء من رجال الأعمال المصريين أو رجال الأعمال من خارج مصر في الاستثمارات في محافظة الإسكندرية لدينا العديد من البرامج ولدينا العديد من المشروعات ومحافظة الإسكندرية بترحب وتستقبل أي من رجال الأعمال والمستثمرين من الداخل أو الخارج للاستثمارات في الطاقة ولدينا أرباح جيدة بشكل طيب شكرا Thank you. Thank you. Really? Yes. He was oh, yeah. Sorry, I, I just want to want to add something to answer the question because it's uh, funnily enough, it's also a question that we're asking ourselves because everybody in my administration is running from uh, energy efficiency projects in terms of private uh, housing, um, and this is because and and now I'm in generally I'm, I apologize for always kind of being the Cassandra. I've, I've been mayor for two years and I, I think uh, uh, I, I'm I'm still lacking kind of Arion's uh, uh, success <laughs> stories. I'm, I'm it's still an uphill uphill climb. Uh, but indeed, our, our problem with those kind of projects is that it's extremely complicated because we're like, if, if we're dealing with an old, uh, let's say, building uh, uh, built in, in the communist times, there are 40, 50 different owners uh, that we have to deal with as a city administration. And then we have to scale that a, a hundred times or 150 times. Uh, there are different funding programs. S some ask us to kind of fund it completely, the whole project. Some want a part uh, where the, the owners of the apartments also contribute. Uh, we've had some bad experiences with uh, uh, with technical solutions that that didn't work, and you know some private investor who came in with I don't know what uh, great idea, and then it's up and it didn't work, and then obviously the the citizens were angry at the mayor uh, because the, we had to stop uh, uh, working with it. So it's really something that that right now uh, uh, many are running from, and I think <laughs> maybe one solution uh, solution could be to really. Uh, <laughs> find a solution that circumvents actually public administration and, and a, a truly private mechanism um, that, uh, you know, where, where you have the whole communication, where you have a standardized procedure, uh, but also the technical solution, the building itself, where uh, an, an owner's association uh, that is owning a, a private apartment building can apply for uh, and with with generous uh, uh, funding opportunities, I think you know, 10, 15 years, it's it's possible in a in a in a city like like Timisoara, uh, because as uh, the more players are in this, uh, let's say, mess, the more complicated and more bureaucratic it gets. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, I, th I think we still have to find the right mechanisms for these kind of projects. Not easy. Um, we are finishing with the last intervention from Melanie, please, on this question. And I'm told we are running out of time. Yeah. Melanie, over to you. So the last word on energy efficiency. What you've just described, I think, is an absolutely great example of what we need to see happen, and it's worked in some places. But also, the other kind of paradigm change we have is digitalization. So with cheap um, semiconductors, uh, sensor technologies, telecoms technologies, we can measure the opportunities better, we can prove they worked, and we can create better confidence in energy efficiency, particularly through these business models we've described. So, you know, a com combination of these two things should change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melanie. And thank you, my panel, again. Please give a good round of applause to the panelists.
Thank I you. used to live in Kimishawa a long time ago. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you, everybody. And another round of applause for a great panel. Thank you very much. <laughs> we are now going to have a, a couple of minutes break as we reconfigure the stage for the next session, which um, will be on in about two minutes. So please don't go away. We have a fantastic fireside chat for you. And if I can ask the technical people to come forward. And uh, Barbara, thank you. down now we're about to start the next session thank you very much if you could take your seats if you could uh, retake your seats please that would be fantastic thank you very much thank you we're going to start again in one minute I see people are taking photos of each other that's very nice lots of tweets uh, if you could please take your seat again and for our online audience, thanks for bearing with us. We're going to be with you in just a minute. OK, um, if I could have EBRD colleagues just starting to get people seated down. Can you just, thank you.
We have this mic again, please. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to start. If you could take your seats, we're going to be live in about 30 seconds. I don't want the online audience to see you taking a seat. Could be embarrassing. Yeah, we're on again. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, we're about to start, and I'm uh, handing over to my colleague, Lynn. So if you could please take your seats. Um, we are online live in five, four, three, two, one. Lynn, over to you. Welcome back to the Green Cities Annual Event 2022. Gender considerations have always been critical to EBRD Green Cities program. And as we've seen from the previous panel, Green Cities, it's all about joined up thinking. It's all about involvement of, of stakeholders, including those children. And as Harry said, it's not just about climate and carbon. So picking up from that, we now provide gender assessments in the Green City Action Plans and include gender equality and economic inclusion in urban infrastructure investments. From safety for all in public transportation, gender responsive design of public spaces, to women's representation in leadership and decision making in cities. Vienna's pioneering experience in mainstreaming gender in this city provides lessons and good practices for cities in the EBRD region. To present further context, it is my pleasure to introduce Seble Nagusi, the gender split specialist from the Green Climate Fund for her video message. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure for me to be here to give an address to an event that is both exciting and held at an opportune time. Exciting because we will be able to see and learn from the fruits of relentless investments made by the City of Vienna towards mainstreaming gender. Opportune time because I believe every day and every second spent on addressing gender issues is an opportune time and wise if not the wisest investment. The Green Climate Fund supports a gender mainstreaming approach and encourages our partners and their partners to continue to develop their skills, investments, and interest in this area. Our gender policy was designed with the understanding that gender issues matter and matter significantly in the context of climate change and in our day-to-day -day operations. Gender mainstreaming is possible when gender assessments are conducted and the findings are integrated into actionable interventions. We've given particular attention to gender analysis as a way of building better and comprehensive understanding of gender issues and a bit to institutionalize gender mainstreaming as well as investing towards gender sensitive and responsive actions. Gender action plans are expected to be then developed based on the gender analysis, which should be financially and technically sound and developed through relevant stakeholders participation. From what we have seen so far, we noted that it has not been easy for many of our partners to conduct a comprehensive gender analysis. But we hope as we work together and as we learn through processes and results, we'll all agree and are invested in conducting gender analysis as part of our development of our interventions. Unless we understand the differentiated needs, expectations, challenges, and opportunities for women, men, boys and girls, and vulnerable groups, our services will not be accessed will not be adequately used and will isolate some groups and provide skewed benefits. We hope through the discussions and what will be discussed during the day, we'll all come out with a better understanding of lived in challenges, opportunities and way forward for unequitable and gender mainstreamed investment. We are encouraged by EBRD's effort in organizing events and its continued collaborative work with institutions, countries and experts in the field of gender and diverse sectors. We also commend the exchange of ideas and lessons learned on this very important issue.
We, are, we thank the organizers, speakers, and all participants for, for their engagement and hope the exchanges today will positively influence our work and day-to-day -day approaches, thereby ensuring inclusivity and gender responsiveness of all our actions. Once again, thank you for the opportunity and wish you all a successful deliberation. So thank you very much to Seb Lay from the Green Climate Fund, and let's get that discussion going. So I would like to invite to the stage Ursula Bauer, who is the head of section of gender mainstreaming at the City of Vienna, and our very own Barbara Rambusek, the director for gender and economic inclusion at EBRD. Thank you very much. Well, it's an absolute delight for me to be here uh, and to have this very important conversation, particularly because I actually come from Vienna. So it's very important and very nice to see uh, how my own city is doing so well in this context. Um, so actually, Ursula, if you could start uh, with a question looking at the, the rationale. You know, Vienna is clearly doing very well. Uh, why did Vienna start to focus on integrating gender into how it operates and runs the city, designs urban public spaces um, and, and provides services? What's, what's, what's the business case? Well, I think it's in our DNA. It's as it all started after the First World War, when women were the land of the last resort, with men completely traumatized from war, uh, rather destructed system, you know, the old Austrian empire broke down. So there had to be some new innovations when it comes to economy and to social and uh, to societal changes. And so for the first time already after the First World War, women's, so to say, women's issues, which are relevant to the whole society, which means aspects of care work were taken into account. And social housing started, kindergarten started, uh, there were some new pilot projects on social housing in offering a communal kitchens so that homework would no longer be the task for women. And uh, well, after some problems, <laughs> we all know from the 20th century. Uh, the next booster was coming from the Women's World Conference in 1995 and from the EU, which made clear there's a new strategy. It's not to change women and to adapt them to the system, but it's gender mainstreaming, which rather means the other way around. We have to mm -hmm. arrange the system so that women don't have all these troubles and no longer discriminated. So it changed the shift and uh, the perspective changed from prevention instead of doing the repair work and cleaning up the mess of non-being gender equal. And so, um, yes, we just got started and I think it's all it proves it's an economical benefit. We did some studies as did the OECD and did the EU. If you do investments in gender equality, it's good for the whole society. So it's also good for men because equal living conditions are good for everybody. And when you look at public space in Vienna, when you look at the reasons of safety and security, labor market, education, if you get women in and if you get the perspective of women and especially of everyday life and of care work in, you really get a better city. I mean, we are the first, <laughs> the first city in the uh, most livable cities index. So this also clearly shows that if you take a different perspective, if you don't only look at it from an economic side, if you don't take only technology into account, you get better cities. Absolutely, and I think what is also very nice in a way is that that long historical arc that you, you're drawing, um, in a way coming from a crisis, like we've heard mm -hmm. today, we are faced by multiple crises, but they can open up opportunities yep. as, as, as it did in, in, in a way in Vienna. Definitely. So tell us a bit more about what you actually do. How does that turn into concrete actions? How do you integrate gender practically, operationally? Well, I think we are integrating it everywhere in the city. So there is not just one pilot project, but we have a gender anchor to the labor market policies of the city, to city planning, to um, health issues, which are really important to educational issues, but uh, which is really our big success and our showcase project. Uh, this is uh, a fair shared city, a fair shared space. And as we are at a Green Cities Conference, I'd like to highlight one, pro one uh, topic, and this is public lighting. Because public lighting is crucial for safety and security in the city. If you have a dark city, 
of course, everybody feels a bit uncertain, but especially for women and girls, this is a threat. Maybe not by objective data, but uh, by the subjective feeling of safety and security. So and if you think how many women are working late hours or early morning shifts and they would have to use a dark city where they feel uncomfortable, maybe a lot of them would go back to cars, which then uh, gets me to the climate issue, because if you want to have people using the streets, if you want to have people walk and use the bike instead of using the car and uh, use public transport, you need good lighting. But yet what happens quite often, as we see it all over Europe, uh, now with climate change, a lot of people come up and say, oh, we have to reduce public lighting, it's a nightmare, we are threatening animals, and uh, it's also bad for our energy because we are using too much energy. And this also leads to the crisis issue now, as a lot of cities say, well, we have to reduce public lighting or even cut it off in non -very, not very frequented areas uh, because of the energy. Well, I think this is the wrong approach, because as I said, uh, you're really putting women and girls at risk. You're putting women, and women at risk uh, when it comes to the economical part, because they can't participate in the labor market in the same way, and they will go back to ecological, non-ecological uh, non behavior. So uh, please stick to public lighting and instead use innovation. As the city shows, in the city of Vienna, and I think some other cities are already doing the same, uh, same innovation, uh, we are changing now most of our lights to LED, which helps to reduce energy up to 60%. So there is no need just to use the safe and the, so to say, quick option, cut off the light, but use innovation and use innovation with thinking who, and this is one very crucial thing for gender equality, ask who needs this city service most and who would be the ones who you put at risk if you don't offer it anymore. And um, one last point to, the, to this, this uh, public lighting. Well, we know that there is a European standard which ha helps lighting departments uh, to uh, find out about the ideal and the best standard of lighting or in, of streets. But we took a close look at this European standard together with the Viennese lighting department and we found out there are only cars taken into account. You know, you have a, a standard which should light the public space for everybody, but actually the basis and the data that is used is merely based on cars, buses, and tramways, and not on the pedestrians, but those who need the lighting because they have no lights. Cars have street, have, have their own lights, <laughs> but pedestrians don't have that, and uh, people on the bike lane, uh, very little either. So. We have to find out how to integrate this uh, walking uh, uh, issue. And so we set up a very short, you know, very pragmatical 10 points Excel sheet uh, together with our lighting department, which asks what are the feelings of safety in this area? Do people feel safe there? Is there any kind of social control? Are there any important infrastructure, social infrastructure buildings? Is there any criminal problem maybe nearby? And the last question is, I think, also crucial because it asks the people, well, would you let your young daughter or your young son going back home alone in this era? And uh, when you come to the, to the end of, the, of this checklist and you have a certain amount of points you ticked, then the, it tells you automatically, act, uh, be, be, be prepared, there might be a security problem, please get up a higher standard of lightning and talk to your local politicians. So this is a reminder which is now included to all new lighting projects. So we had one, we had a pilot idea and now it's included to the mainstream. So I think this is also one matter of success because we don't stick to pilot projects, but we rather change the mainstream or at least we add some new aspects to the normal processing. I think that's absolutely fascinating to hear. Also, when we think about decision-making processes, you talked about pilots, you talked about questionnaires. Mm -hmm. How do you change how these decisions are taken? Who takes the decisions? What the process is that leads to certain decisions? How do you integrate gender into budgets, into, into sort of <laughs> the, the, the big questions um, that happen, I guess, here, but, but also across yeah. the city? Well, I think the most important... Um thing is you have to do lobbying and I was installed with my office at the chief executive office as a kind of watchdog. You know, we are the ones who are 
not always the nice ones because we come and we say, well, we point out where well, there's gender missing again. But actually, what you need and what is the first step is backing from politics and from the senior management because otherwise you're lost. I mean, you can do some guerrilla action, which <laughs> happened <laughs> a long time. But uh, when we started gender mainstreaming and gender budgeting in 2005, it was quite, quite clear you need political backing and you need backing of the senior management, which we've got for ages, and this is really a great help, and I'm very thankful for that, because otherwise I couldn't do my work. The next is you really have to include everybody, and this is why we set up gender budgeting, mm -hmm. which is uh, a decree, so nobody can escape. You have to do a kind of gender analysis of what you're doing for the, for, the, for the plan for your next year's budget, and you have to think, with my expenses, what can I do to contribute to reduce gender gaps, what can I do to prevent discrimination? And this can be little things, you know, just like uh, an information sheet for the University of Applied Sciences who just never thought of uh, showing women role models. But it can be really big things when you say, okay, we're going to change street lighting, you know, or we are going to have a new social housing project really focusing on single mothers. So this can be the big things, but you have really to have on one hand to have the directive so that everybody is included. And then in the next year, you have the statement of accounts and you have to do a monitoring and to see, well, did, they, did, did that happen what they, what they uh, actually mm -hmm. proposed and do they meet their goals? And as gender equality is a long term investment, you know, it doesn't show up right after one year. You really have to stick to it. And um, I think it was also very important to link it to gender budgeting as you all know, as soon as budgeting is involved, people take it serious. Because when I come there for feedback talks, we're going out for feedback talks to talk to our different departments. I always take my colleague from the uh, budgeting era. She's the head of the gender budgeting unit within the finance department. And she's also responsible for parts of the budgeting of the city. So this makes a better impression, you know. <laughs> it's, it's not like anymore, it's a feel-good topic, but it's a topic you should better give a second thought to. Well, there is a very famous quote, of course, show me your budget and I'll show you and I tell you your priorities. Yeah. So yeah. if yeah. gender is not in the budget, it clearly is, is not a priority. Definitely, yeah. That's so um, we've had a lot of mayors here um, today uh, earlier, and I hope they're also here in the audience now. Um, if they were interested now in, in, in focusing more on gender and making their city mo cities more uh, uh, gender equal and gender inclusive, what would your advice to them be as they set out? Well, the first is really give backing. So if you want to change anything, then you have to stand up, especially if you're a man, and give backing to your gender experts. Mm -hmm. Because this is so important. As a mayor, you are a role model, and you're setting the agenda. And you and your team has to be uh, clear in, and in regular terms, you know, not just once, but uh, on a standard and uh, on a sustainable way to look after gender equality. And the second is just get informed, get to know what your, the people in your city want. So we are always doing surveys on a regular basis, and I think this is also necessary just to find out what people need. Mm -hmm. and, uh, this, and try to get them in in participatory processes. And the last, and I think the most important advice is just get started. You know, don't wait for a gender analysis. It doesn't have to be perfect, but grab any kind of opportunities. Or if you're uh, constructing a new park, if you're doing uh, some reconstruction of a metro line, if you're doing housing projects, just think, what could we do for gender? Just try it. If it's not perfect, just go for it and take the results, do an evaluation and get to the mainstream. So then you have gender on the agenda and this is what is important. So I guess it's, it's a journey, um, but it's about starting the journey, learning alongside the journey. Yeah. Um, and maybe also actually, as, as we do today, learning from each other. Um, from yeah. a, a, along this that journey and inspiring yeah, yeah. And, and, and in a way feeding that process that way. Well, that brings me to my question. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think the EBRD is really doing great work and you're involving such a lot of partners. You are, no, I'm just dealing with one city, but you have a, a, very, uh, a big number of cities and uh, different partners you have to get involved. So how do you uh, get them motivated and to, to start with these gender issues? So um, we very much start with, with the business case in a way, as you have done in a in, in, in very specific way, uh, and given the historical background and, and other things in, in Vienna. But 
fundamentally, I think we, we look at cities um, as, as our clients, our partners, um, and then we look at the challenges that they face, but also the opportunities that are there for them. Fundamentally, cities compete for talent. They compete for people. They compete for investments, for innovations. They need to grow and thrive. Um, but that is not always easy um, because there are certain challenges. There is outward migration. There is brain drain um, and, and so forth. So, in order to um, make that business case to mayors, we, we, we actually look at that business case. How could you make your city more attractive for everybody? Um, uh, how could you use the talent that exists mm -hmm. within the city? Um, all the ingenuity, all the talent, all the innovation, all the energy um, that your city could offer in the best possible way. And rather than just use half your talent pool, use your entire talent pool. And I think that is a very compelling argument. So it's about the skills, the innovation, how could you bring the private sector employers into um, shaping curricular skills provision so that the people in your city actually have the skills that are needed in your labor market. Um, and how could you therefore also avoid brain drain, um, avoid people moving away, avoid in, in way also investments draining away. away. The second area is entrepreneurship. How can you create opportunities for people to turn those ideas and that human capital into entrepreneurship opportunities? And here I would say that women continue to be underserved. Um, I think the global um, gap in, in finance for women is over 1.7 trillion globally. So women really constitute the world's largest emerging market. And it's sitting right there in your city. You just have to, to, to take it and, and nurture it and bring it on. Um, and then the third important point really is about services. And we've heard a little bit about that already during the first um, panel this morning. Who uses your services, your transport connectivity, your trains, your buses? And how could you, by making them safer, more attractive to use, how could you increase that ridership, that usership, and therefore also increase revenues and ultimately make the service more um, uh, compelling and better for everybody in the city? So it's, it's, it's really about making that business case and, and working with our partners in, in the cities to then actually turn that vision into concrete actions and helping them uh, through our investments, through our engagement uh, on policy engagement, through the Green Cities Action Plans, where we already look very much from the start what we can do in relation to mainstreaming gender across um, both the policy areas to shape the decisions, get more women into decision-making processes. We know, for example, that um, amongst the 300 largest cities in the world, only 25 are led by women. So there is clearly a lot more um, that we can do to bring women's voices into shaping how, how cities are, are run. So, so that's fundamentally what we're, what we're trying to oh, do. Well, well, you, you really mentioned the, the top, the top uh, reasons. I think it's uh, do not lose your talent yeah, <laughs> and make your services better, because this is really what you can see is gender equality and gender checks, gender analysis are uh, equality tool so and are a quality a quality management tool this mm -hmm. is uh, really important and you should make use of that and so do you have any concrete examples because i went a bit through your website and i think this is incredible what's happening already but do you have any examples that highlight exactly what brings the, the benefits and uh, the business case uh, to everybody yes absolutely so um particularly if we if we take the example of the green cities um uh, we actually start with the Green Cities Action Plan. So we sit down with the city authorities, we look at what are the key challenges that they face, how does the current way the city operates impact on women, mm -hmm. and how could it be done in a better way to open up skills and jobs and services, entrepreneurship opportunities, all, the, all these things. Um, uh, so it's a particular focus on, on green skills uh, and jobs, inclusive procurement, so that's where, um, where cities actually procure anything from I don't know, um, new roads being developed or transport solutions being put in, how can they actually nudge, or more than nudge, um, ask the contracting companies to offer on-site training opportunities, particularly to young women, uh, par work in partnerships with schools, vocational schools, technical schools, universities, uh, offer work-based learning opportunities, apprenticeships, traineeships, um, and actually involve people in the opportunities that are being created by these sometimes very large um, um, construction com um, contracts, 
uh, or also maintenance contracts that go over a long time. Uh, another big area, of course, is safe transport um, and um, making it making trains and, and bus companies uh, more safer to use uh, for women. So maybe let me give you some, some concrete examples. Um, overall, I think about 80% of all our Green Cities programs now have a, a very strong gender component, and that uh, number is, is rising fast. I think um, 11 out of 12, um, I've been told this year, already have a gender component, and we'll get that last one uh, as well. So um, maybe concretely, what do we do? In Moldova, um, in Balti, uh, we have a district heating project. And you may wonder, district heating, what does that have to do with gender equality and what, you know, what do we do in relation to promoting gender uh, in this context? It's about taking decisions about what kind of energy you consume uh, at the household level. And here women have a lot of agency because they very often take these decisions. So it's about um, education, capacity building and nudging actually uh, uh, households and in this context particularly women to make better choices uh, towards greener energy solutions. So what we are working there is with a client who actually came to us because they said that their customer satisfaction is very low. Um, what, what can we do to help them to, to improve that? And what we are doing is it's about um, building capacity, educating customers in terms of better energy uh, um, decisions. Um, and those customers very often largely are, are women. Another example, and here actually I have a range of examples, uh, is in relation to safe transport. So in Tbilisi, which is one of our very first um, green cities overall, but also in Istanbul and in, in, in Cairo, in Egypt, we work very closely with the city authorities to improve safe transport for women on metros, on ferries, on uh, bus lines, uh, whatever it is. So here we take a, a quite a comprehensive approach. It's really about a, a range of different things. It's about public awareness. So in Egypt, for example, we run a huge public awareness campaign uh, that started off with a survey to understand how do women feel using railways uh, in Egypt, in Cairo in particular. We found a very, very high percentage of women who have directly experienced harassment on the railways. So that's just to, to establish, in a way, a baseline. It's then about building uh, awareness uh, for everybody, what that means for women who are then therefore not using public transport. Um, how could public transport be made safer through better lighting, CCTV, um, but also better training um, in terms of how the, 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 um, the stations are run, who's actually present at the stations. Um, but then also things like using technology. There is an app now where women can actually report um, immediately incidents of harassment, and that is then um, directed to, 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 be, uh, to the police and to be followed up. So there are a number of different ways in which we can, we can use uh, technology. In Tbilisi, we're currently, for example, exploring the use of big data to better understand travel patterns um, and therefore um, identifying travel times and, and locations uh, that could be safer for women uh, to use. So um, it's a whole comprehensive package of things. Um, and we actually see a lot of take up and a lot of interest from companies and from our partners. And then maybe a final example in, in Dushanbe in Tajikistan, um, a focus on e-mobility. So this is about the introduction of um, electric vehicles um, and that creates an entire new ecosystem within a city and an entire new infrastructure that is required. Um, but also with that come jobs um, and the need for skilled jobs. So this is about getting women in those, into those technical areas, into science, technology, um, engineering and math, the so-called STEM jobs, uh, and opening up opportunities for them in this new emerging and, and as we see, very fast growing sector. So that's, that's just another example that I thought uh, could well, be Well, that's great. Maybe I should send our colleagues then to, <laughs> to do Shanbe because what we really like in Vienna is uh, women working in the STEM sector and girls interested in the STEM mm -hmm. sector. So uh, maybe we could have an exchange Absolutely. program. <laughs> yeah. Also Vienna, yes, still we are a champion, but we do have to learn something and uh, I would be happy to, to get more, uh, more exchange in that and learning from others. But um, still, when I look at the cities you are providing and you're including in your programs, there are still some cities who face really multiple crises. Mm -hmm. So uh, what can be done to keep gender on the agenda, even in times of crisis? So I think, as we've heard um, 
many times already before, and in a way also the example of, of Vienna is, is, is a good one here. Um, crises uh, exacerbate gender gaps, they exacerbate inequalities in a number of different ways, starting with, with sexual harassment and violence, uh, but also very often additional care uh, requirements. Um, and uh, now we see in, in relation to the Ukraine, the war on Ukraine, uh, it, the um, internally displaced people, but also refugees are predominantly women with children. So there is a very, very specific gender angle uh, to many crises. Um, if we look at Ukraine specifically, um, as ha I think Harry already mentioned this morning, we have seven green cities in Ukraine. We are in close contact with them. Uh, and what we're undertaking uh, for Ukraine is a rapid assessment of the specific needs uh, that our partner cities face there. Uh, that is in relation to the influx of uh, internally displaced people, but also the destruction of, of their, their cities. Um, but also uh, in relation to the skills, um, the jobs, um, and how um, connectivity uh, and, and livelihoods are affected in this context. So this is an area that we take very seriously and, and hopefully we can uh, work with those cities in Ukraine. What we do in other cities uh, ac in, in across the wider region that are affected by the influx of refugees is to better understand what the changing needs are um, due to the influx of refugees and how we can support them directly during these uh, periods. Barbara, excuse me, excuse me, Ursula. We need to go offline from the stream uh, at 12.30, and that's in about 30 seconds. So uh, if we could bring this to a close, please. Uh, I suggest if you um, maybe just wrap up with a couple of main points, and then we'll uh, talk about logistics for the afternoon. Thank you. We, we won't have time for questions, unfortunately. No, I think that's fine. That's fine, Nelson. Thank you very much. So I think, I mean, I'm. I think we've come to the end. I think it was. I think yeah. the main message from my side is we all need to learn from each other. We can learn from each other. There are some cities uh, across different parts of um, the world, really, who do particularly well in certain areas. And it's about events like this where we can come together and learn. Yeah. And my final point is what I said before: get started. Whatever you're doing, you can't do wrong. The the worst thing you can do is not take equality into account and just try what, ha what, what works in your city. Just do it. Thank you very much. Barbara, Ursula, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And for those of you joining us online on YouTube and EBRD.com, thanks for joining us. Um, we are going to finish the online streaming now, I understand. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're now offline.